Thanks, Simon. As developers, we get the best work done when we just have the opportunity to sit down undistracted and get into the flow. Context switching greatly reduces our efficiency, and it can cause us a lot of frustration. How many of you would love to work in a world where you get to work in a consistent, expressive, concise, and fun programming language all day, both for the app development you do, as well as the tools to build it? I know I would. <laughs> when it comes to building Android, we may use a mix of languages in the app source and the build tool source. Everything from Java, Groovy, XML, JavaScript if there's any web stuff, native code could be in C, C++. There's a lot of stuff going on here and it can really slow us down and inhibit new developers to the code base. I'm Ty and I'm an Android developer at Uber working on our external developer platform. Today I'm gonna to walk you through this fun or new language that some of you may have heard about by now called Kotlin and how it can help make your life a little bit better and more consistent throughout the entire development stack. I'll walk you through a short overview of the language and then specific real world examples, primarily focused on using it in the, the build tools. But first, remember to use the conference app to rate and ask questions. Before we begin with Kotlin, why isn't Java good enough for us? One of the major talking points lately has been when Android will see true Java 8 support. Recently, along with the end release, we did hear word of 8 support with the new compiler Jack. However, we're kind of in a fragmented world when it comes to the languages that Android supports. With Jack, you get the Lambda support and you get the newer API features for the brand new release, but we all know how Android users are slow to adopt new versions. So Java 7 has support for a larger set of devices, uh, I believe from Kit and up, and below that, they're still stuck on Java 6 support. So with that fragmentation, it's really hard to focus on just using a newer language. Java and Android can both be quite error prone as well. Capturing inner classes, for example, leaves your apps prone to memory leaks, especially when passing those on to asynchronous operations. Hopefully you got to see the talk by PY earlier. He dove a lot more into the leaks that can be associated with that. If you didn't get a chance to see that today, I'd recommend watching that video. There are also several syntactical problems with Java beside lambdas, which is kind of the most popular thing that people say they want, such as the collection streaming and other systematic problems such as the verboseness, nullability, and mutability. These syntactical problems can be resolved with some great libraries that help improve the app development experience and safely backport some of those features from Java 8 and 7 to previous versions, libraries like Jack, Retro Lambda, and even RxJava. But these systematic problems cause a bit of uh, an issue, though. Well, Groovy is what's primarily used in, uh, for building Gradle, and it's an expressive and useful language. However, I think it also has a few limitations that make it less than ideal for a world where we wanted this consistency across. The first is that it's a, that the first is that it's a dynamic language while Kotlin is statically typed. Gradle's gonna spend more time processing the language because of the runtime checking that needs to be done. And it's been noted that using Kotlin in your Gradle builds will speed up the configuration step. Because Groovy is dynamic, it's harder for the IDE to be smart for you, to parse, to autocomplete, and therefore it's gonna be more prone to error. You're gonna have to do the build before you can often see that there's an issue and that's gonna slow down the feedback cycle. By using a statically typed language, you allow the IDE to be smarter for you and help give you these issues before you have to spend the time. Groovy brings a number of performance and memory concerns if it was gonna be used specifically on Android as well. So that might limit this consistency that we talked about. For example, the standard runtime for Groovy is quite large. And the dynamic nature means that the garbage collector in Android would be running quite frequently, which could cause a poor user experience and cause frames to drop. Wouldn't it be great to have consistency between our build scripts plugins and the deliverable code? Well, I think that we can get that by using Kotlin. With all type, I'm sure you've heard a thing or two about it. I believe there's been a few other talks already about Kotlin here at the conference. But for those of you who haven't got a chance to hear about it, I'll walk through a few of the advantages of it. It's built by the folks at JetBrains, the, the people behind IntelliJ and most of the Android Studio work, and it's, completely in the, it's built completely in the open. And it's designed with mobile first in mind, with Android developers being a really large target audience for them. 
they reached their 1.0 milestone somewhat recently. So we have a stable eye, and many of the top apps are already starting to integrate or explore integration. Since the first time I gave this talk, the Gradle team has also announced official support for Kotlin and build scripts as well. While it's still in its infancy, the dedication from the team and the official announcement means that going forward, we'll see it treated as a first-class citizen. Because it's designed to work with Android and mobile first in mind, the bytecode that's generated by Kotlin is 100% compatible with the JVM6. So it covers that fragmentation problem that I mentioned earlier. And you don't really need to convert your entire project to Kotlin to start using it. You can use it right away because Kotlin is fully interoperable with Java. You can intermix them in the same project. The language has its own standard runtime. And this library does need to be bundled with your application. Fortunately, it's quite small, coming in at around 600K last time I checked. Now, if you were to contrast this to the iOS world, which many of you may be familiar with as well, Swift has a very similar setup. You need to bundle Swift with your iOS application. But it comes in at around 10 megs. For Android, it's pretty important, especially if we're going to consider targeting emerging markets, that we need to keep our app binaries small. And fortunately, Kotlin allows us to do that. Because Kotlin is statically typed, as I mentioned earlier, and it keeps memory allocation in mind, we don't have the same type of runtime overhead that we would, be, that we would have by uh, using a dynamically typed language like Groovy. This could be a large constraint on Android, where the GC would be making that more problematic. Lastly, Kotlin is a modern language with many awesome features that make development fun, and you can use it on all of your Android devices today. But more importantly, Kotlin helps us with many of the constraints that Java, and that Java and Android both introduce. By utilizing Kotlin's type system for null safety, it can help us reduce easy to avoid null pointer error exceptions and make our code much more maintainable. Kotlin gives us a great way to reduce the boilerplate code that's so synonymous with Java. And it makes our code much more maintainable and approachable for other developers. The Android APIs rely primarily on an architecture of inheritance. And although this works well for the teams at Google, it puts the large, larger burden on the app developer, especially when many of us seek an architecture of composition. There are also many APIs that require proper ceremony to complete. You have to call a number of methods in order. Just think about the steps required for toasting, saving SQLite transactions, or using the media recorder. Often you have to initialize, do your work, and then call a commit or save. And if you happen to miss one of those steps, you're only going to discover that at runtime. <laughs> Lastly, while Java is too verbose, in my opinion, to define a maintainable build script, I believe Kotlin is expressive and concise enough to compete with many aspects of Groovy, the preferred build script language of, of Gradle, while providing much needed type safety to reduce errors and expedite the development of your tooling. So we, Kotlin has, brings a lot of cool features to the table. We have higher order functions and properties and mixins, and there's a, there's a lot of these, and I'm only supposed to be up here for about 45 minutes. So I'm just going to go through a few of these today that I think will be really promising and help with your tooling. So one of the most common exceptions in Java development is the null pointer exception, infamously known as the billion dollar mistake. Unfortunately, Java doesn't have a first class representation of something that may or may not be null. And we've seen many libraries and tooling try to address this in the past with band-aids on top of Java. By having runtime-based checks for null, it makes the code much more susceptible, even when we're using those null checks. And having the potential of value of null requires defensive programming, which leads to much less maintainable code as well. So here's our first example to show Kotlin's variable assignments. You'll notice that Kotlin uses a syntax where it reverses the type and name ordering for variable declaration. In this case, we'll get a compile time exception on that second line, as we're not allowed to assign null to var a. However, in this next example, you'll note the question mark along with the declaration. This indicates to Kotlin that the value may be null, and we'll take care of checking that. Once we try to utilize the variable, though, we will see a compilation error, as we needed to explicitly check for null before using. You may notice the two different ways of declaring the variable here, both var and val. And to clarify, Kotlin uses var to indicate that it's a mutable variable, while it uses val to indicate that it's an immutable value. 
In this last example of nullability, we can see a few different formats to check for null. The first line of code, you'll note the question mark in use again. When that is declared, any further method calls on that object will return null if the parent object is null. And this removes the need for us to do the nested if null checks in Java. In the second line of code, we follow a slightly different format. Instead of utilizing null, we specify a default value using a single expression if else. And in this last example, we take advantage of the Elvis operator to simplify the syntax of the previous examples. Let's move on to another cool feature of Kotlin, class properties. In this example, we'll define a class called user and specify a member variable for the name. Using the syntax where we put the member in line with the class name is one approach, although we could specify it below in the class as well, which may be more familiar to some of you. Although this looks like a standard Java field, this is a synthetic property. This means that the getters and setters are automatically generated for us, and that's what's being used near the bottom of the slide. That definitely helps clean up some of that boilerplate code. We can, however, override the default generated getters and setters to specify custom logic by declaring a get and a set method below the property definition. You'll notice that we changed the syntax for the property declaration here as well from the previous slide. This is just another way of handling that. In addition to using properties to clean up boilerplate code, Kotlin offers a concept called a data class. This is designed to be a lightweight POJO and, and do all of those things that a standard POJO in Java would normally need to take care of. By, advising, by adding the data keyword in the declaration, we get this behavior. It'll automatically generate an equals and a hash code method for us, so we no longer need to define that. And it'll also create the toString method with all of the constructor parameters that we defined. Lastly, it'll generate the copy method for us with default parameters so that you don't have to implement builders to copy uh, and create immutable POJOs throughout your code base. Data classes do have many limits as well. For example, they cannot extend another class or be abstract. So I'd definitely recommend looking up the restrictions of this in the Kotlin documentation to decide if it's right for you. Let's move on to another example. Function literals, or lambdas, are a great way to make code more readable and have come to be expected from modern languages today. Java 6 doesn't have support for these, but by using a framework like Retro Lambda that rewrites the bytecode from a lambda, a Java 7 or a Java 8 lambda, to a single abstract method is a great way for us to get that in Android today. Lucky for us, we get it out of the box with Kotlin. In this example, we see a few different syntactical ways to write them. They will infer the type from the definition, so we can reference the variables directly in the first example. In the second, with, the with only a single parameter, we can refer to it as the standard it notation, similar to Groovy or many other languages. And we can store the function literal in variables such that we can access it later when needed. Expanding on the function literal concept, Kotlin also provides us with higher order functions, or functions that take functions as parameters or return them. This is a very powerful technique to write clean, readable code. And we'll get to see some more powerful examples of this in real world use cases for cleaning up Android and Gradle code as soon as we understand the last concept required. And that last concept that I want to talk about is extension functions. Kotlin gives you the ability to add methods to existing types. And this is very powerful and similar to other languages like c -sharp. And it's a great way to replace the utility hell that Java has known to become, where you have a util class representing interactions with an object that's out of your control. The syntax requires that you just define the type.method name, and then the code interacts with that class as if it was owned by that class. Please note that you cannot override existing methods of a class with, a function, with an extension function. Another thing to note is that Kotlin only gives you access to the method that you defined in a class where you've defined the function extension. If you wanted to use it in other classes, you would need to explicitly import it from the class where you had defined it. I mentioned earlier that, function, that extension functions were a great way to avoid that util hell in Java, but I also mentioned that Kotlin is completely interoperable with Java. So what is this actually doing? It's generating a class with a static method that intercepts calls to the object in Kotlin. But in Java, you can, that, you can call that generated static util directly. Kotlin will assign a default name to the file based on the file name, 
but you can specify something custom by using the annotation here, file JVM name with a string for the file. If you wanted to group multiple of these extension functions into one util class instead of having one generated per, you could use this other annotation and declare the name uh, and use the JVM multi-file class annotation to do that. This can be really powerful in Android. Here's the traditional way of saving an object into shared preferences in Java. You can see that it requires us to init the preference editor, put the object into the preference editor, and then call apply. And this is prone for error as it requires the ceremony to be followed, exact, followed exactly. And if we don't, then we don't save the value that we expect. So how can we make this better? Here's that same functionality, but using the last three concepts that we talked about using in Kotlin. Extension functions, higher order functions, and function literals. We add a method edit to the shared preference object that takes a function literal that is defined as another extension function of the editor class. And this can be confusing at first, but it's incredibly powerful, and it allows any function literal passed in to behave as if it was a method on the shared preference editor object. This allows us to use the code in a type safe way, knowing that the string is saved without having to worry about referencing the correct editor. A caveat to note, though, is that since Kotlin is Java 6 compatible, using higher order functions imposes cert certain runtime penalties. Each function is an object and it captures a closure. These variables that are accessed in the body of the function, so now we have memory allocations, both for the function objects and for the classes. And the virtual calls introduce runtime overhead as well. But by adding the inline keyword in Kotlin to the function declaration, we are telling the Kotlin compiler to compile the code in line as if we had defined it the very first way that I showed in Java, which is, while prone to error from a maintainability perspective, much more performant for the machine. So now our bytecode between the Kotlin version and the Java version is identical. Remember when I said that Kotlin doesn't add runtime overhead? Well, this is one of those features that really allows for that. These Kotlin features give us a powerful ability to start creating a DSL. There's this cool proof of concept library called Anko, written by the JetBrains team, that allows you to cleanly describe Android layouts using purely Kotlin, without having to use XML, XML at all. And by utilizing higher order functions, you can write a clean Android layout DSL. You may also notice that the syntax is starting to look quite similar to Groovy. So maybe now I've sold you on some of the benefits of Kotlin as a language, and you could see how it could be useful for work in your Android app. But introducing that would add further fragmentation to this to your code base, and you might have Kotlin in your app and a mix of, mix of Groovy and Java in your build tools. So that's up to three languages, JVM languages, just to be thinking about. And humans aren't really that great at context switching. No matter really what you, say, what you think about yourself, studies show that we're not great at it. So this overhead is going to reduce developer productivity. Maybe we can use Kotlin by bringing it to the next level in Gradle. We could use it in the build tool as well. And I'm going to walk through some small examples of, many use case, of a use case many of us have had, how to load API key information so that we can sign outgoing requests to a web server. And there have been a, quite a few talks and blog posts and sample projects to teach us using Kotlin in, in Android specifically. So from now on, I'll just be focusing primarily on inside of Gradle. Of course, to use Kotlin, we need to install it. Uh, it's quite simple to install using Gradle. We just add a build time dependency and apply the plugin and then we include the standard library and runtime. We can intermix uh, the .kt files and the Java files and the Groovy files. Also, to note, be sure to install the IntelliJ or Android Studio Kotlin plugin. It'll make your life a little bit easier. It can even help facilitate adding these dependencies, and it has a provided Java to Kotlin converter. It may not produce the most idiomatic Kotlin, but it's definitely a great start. This gets Kotlin in our runtime code. But let's take a moment to make our build script even better using Kotlin as well. The Kotlin, Gradle support, the Kotlin support in Gradle scripts, specifically, is still a work in progress at the moment. The Gradle team first unveiled Kotlin support for build scripts at Gradle Summit a few months ago. With the benefits of Kotlin in the IDE, it'll now be much easier for us to write and maintain these build scripts. I know I'm really excited for autocomplete in Gradle. At this point, the integration is somewhat limited, though, and it requires some workarounds. Here's an example that I created that's a subset of the larger example in the Gradle repo for Kotlin. 
And I have that linked from the slides. When those get posted, you'll see that. But if you looked carefully at that previous example, you'll notice that there were a couple things that were a little bit off. There's a few lines that just didn't look quite right. And that's because to make Kotlin work in an idiomatic way that most of us are familiar with from Groovy, and what most Android developers are used to in general, I had to add all of these extension functions to get it to work. Some things that I did here. Created a block for the Android tag so that we could use the Android DSL reference. We wanted named access to the release build. Since it's statically typed in Groovy, when you type uh, your build type release brackets, that's actually internally resolving that and doing a lookup with the find by name. And if we want that static compilation, we have to use an extension function to explicitly declare the build type. It's not awesome, but that's one of the workarounds that needed to be done. We also needed to access the default product flavor object directly. If we were just to use the default config uh, that Groovy provides us or that Gradle provides us, it returns the abstract class, so we would have to do uh, an instance of check and cast it to something different, which would be pretty gross. So this allows us to get around that a little bit as well. Also, in standard Groovy, when using the Android build tools, you'll notice that you can set them in SDK and the compile time SDK just using an integer. Well, under the hood, that's actually converting that into an API level object. So uh, we also created a couple extension functions to facilitate being able to take an integer and convert it into that. So you can definitely see that it's a proof of concept. However, it goes to show uh, that the entire Android stack can be used in Kotlin, and we can dig into some examples now that we've moved past the script a little bit into where Kotlin shines without having to have these type of workarounds. And that's in the plugins. So as your, as your build scale and you want to share different logic between the different apps that you have and you start building plugins, this Kotlin in those can be very productive. So here's a common scenario that a lot of Android engineers would be familiar with. A developer would want to sign an outgoing request with a consumer key and secret for authentication on the back end. In this example, we define the key in secret, and then we use them with a generic SDK. Let's focus on that API key part specifically. One obvious improvement that we can do to productionize the code here is to have different API keys for different build types or flavors. For example, due to analytics, you may want a different consumer key in secret used for the developer release and the production release. If this wasn't an SDK but your own web service, you'd also want to define the staging and production credentials this way potentially as well. More interestingly, what if you wanted to push this to an open source repo like GitHub, or allow third-party developers or contractors to work on your source code and you didn't want to expose confidential information? Ideally, we'd have a proper separation of concerns, and we'd have these keys provided to the application during the build process from a secure location on the CI machine. This would meet the previous concern and give us the confidence that when the developer pushed to an open source repo, that they didn't accidentally leak information. This is an example of where the Gradle tooling can really shine. What we have here is the Android Gradle plugin DSL. It allows us to add a constant to the generated build config class that's accessible in the Android source code. We're able to define different keys and secrets for various build types and flavors both. And this syntax is very straightforward. You just declare the type, followed by the name and the value to be accessed. So now we have the keys provided to Gradle to the class that's broadly accessible in our Android source code. Although this allows us to provide different keys for different build types, meeting one of our previous requirements, we still haven't been able to achieve our other goal of separating the API keys from the main repository. So let's take a look at some other techniques that we can use with Gradle to help us there. Gradle provides a number of mechanisms to provide or inject values into the build process. There's the Gradle properties, or sometimes referred to as the project properties, or dash P. This lives in various locations, starting in the local project defined as the gradle.properties file, but also including the user's home in the home slash dot gradle, uh, gradle that lives outside of your repo. There's also the standum, standard system variables set for running, the, running on the terminal with dash D. Lastly, you can always load your own custom property file and then use those values in the rest of your build lifecycle. In practice, the choice varies from team to team, it's largely driven by your own team's policies, working process, and structure. What CI system do you use? What's your onboarding process like for new, en new engineers? And other minor constraints. Once we have the property accessible, this get prop function 
uses both the Gradle properties and the system variables and sets the order of precedence in how they're resolved. So you can have your development key for your dev build, but when it comes to the CI build, you can have your system variable set uh, by a build engineer or DevOps to overwrite that to avoid accidental check-ins, and this could protect confidential information for your organization. And here's how we could use that git prop function in the build.gradle. Whatever that has been set to, we'll inject that into the build config class. Now we've met the capability to, of both of our requirements that we mentioned earlier. We have the separation of concerns, and we're being able to inject that into the different build types. However, if you have multiple keys, it can be tedious to keep track of all the different environment variables required to set up a new development environment or spin up a new CI box. So you might want to create a custom properties file and leave the gradle.properties checked in for insensitive information like the artifact ID, version number, other things like that. And then you may need a file. Uh, another reason you might want a, a properties file like this is, is if you use third-party SDKs that rely on these for pulling out client ID or information like that. Or simply, you just want to onboard new engineers with your own Gradle plugin and simplify that process as you scale out your team. So if you wanted to do that, we'd add it to the .get ignore, and then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll show some code for generating some custom property files from that. So let's create a custom task that can be defined in build.gradle. We get all the values we need, and then we write them into the file for the build. If you're a Java engineer that's not very familiar with Groovy, with output stream will be of interest to you here. It's an extension to the file class implemented by Groovy that just wraps opening a file and reading the output stream. Conceptually, it's very similar to the Kotlin extension functions, function extensions. Groovy, like Kotlin, also does not have checked exceptions, so there's no need for a try catch here. So now all you need to do is run this task once for whenever you have a new environment or a new developer or additional keys. If you add a custom property to the .gitignore file, you can then push this code to a public repo as well without concern. Your team probably has more than one app, though. Maybe for consistency, you want to share some of this code. You want to make sure every app is set up in the same way. Even better, you want to reuse this process for other external apps. So let's make this more consistent for all your apps through building a Gradle plugin. A Gradle plugin has three basic ingredients that I'm going to be talking about today. And the first is the task. It's typically used to represent an action triggered from the command line or another task. You can also extend the project object for various things. Some examples are providing values from the build.gradle or a function to the build.gradle. This is the Lambda object that you normally see in your build.gradle files. Lastly, the plugin itself is used to bind the previous components that we just talked about into the Gradle lifecycle. And this is generally the business logic of your plugin that we need to talk about. A very simple way to create a custom task is by extending the default task class. Functions annotated with the at task action will be called when the task is executed. Create file function here contains the logic that we wrote values into the custom property file with some generalization to allow for reusability. This task requires key and output file to be provided so that the plugin consumer supplies their own lists of the keys and the path to the file that they want to write. Because this code will sit outside of the build.gradle, we could have written it in Java. Let's do a simple example to demonstrate why I think Groovy or Kotlin would be preferable to Java in this example. This is what it looks like in Java. As you can see, it's a lot more ugly than the Groovy version that we just looked at. It includes additional try-catch, null checks, and while Java developers acclimate over time to seeing that and kind of tuning it out and looking at the business logic, it actively discourages many new developers from approaching the code base, especially when they're coming from different languages. How many of you have opened up an Objective-C file and had a hard time looking past all the brackets? That's the exact same feeling that non-Java developers get when they look at Java code like this. Unfortunately, it's a barrier for entry, and I believe Kotlin can help us out with that. For dramatic effect, I'll show you what it looks like if we just commented out all that ceremonial code, all that boilerplate. And this is about as concise as the Groovy version. And as you can see, it's much easier to follow along what's going on. Now that we've followed this small rabbit hole down, let's get back on track with our plugin example. To continue along with the task, 
Another important part of it is the defined inputs and outputs. Input is a Gradle annotation that marks a field as an input task to be completed. An output file is another Gradle annotation that's declared in an output of the task for this file. They're particularly important for incremental building for the Gradle, and for the Gradle clean task to empower proper caching and fast builds for the consumers of this plugin. To make it easier for our plugin consumers to configure the task, we'll provide an extension. An extension is a simple class that allows the plugin consumer to provide the certain data required to run the plugin. For example, it's the Gradle, so it's, it's primarily inside of the Gradle plugin DSL, so this is what you're used to. And an example of this is uh, it's using a Pogo, or a Groovy version of a Pojo, and this gives us the functionality to create that Lambda. Now, these data members at compile time will be provided with getters and setters similar to the synthetic properties in Colin. To make it more idiomatic, we'll, provide, we'll also provide the key file to shortcut assignment to file. You can add the get prop function here in the extensions, so the function can be available to any project that applies our plugin. And lastly, the plugin itself that will help us bind and integrate these components into our build lifecycle. First, we want to add our extension into the project object by using the extensions properly. property. This allows us to access the provided data by the plugin consumer and allows them to use its syntax in their build. The plugin class interacts a lot with the project object. And the Gradle provides a configuration function in the project object to allow for a more concise syntax by inferring that project object will be used in the following closure. You can see in the second line here, project extensions for more concise example. This can be inferred to, sim can be inferred to simply as extensions with the configure closure, which performs exactly like the first example. Another important part of the plugins is to make the task available to the project. The after evaluate closure means that if you want the block of code to be called once all the initialization phase of Gradle has been completed. Let's say that we only want to add the task if the keys have actually been assigned. And that is we do it in the after evaluate closure to allow the plugin consumer setting it in their build.gradle. Here we can see how one would use that, plug that plugin in your build.gradle script. So there you have it, our Gradle plugin in Groovy, simplifying your use of the web API keys. Now let's see what it would look like if we try to convert that into Kotlin. Here's the syntax that you should already be familiar with from the earlier introduction that I gave to the language. We have two fields, keys that are a list and file that is nullable. Now, we don't need it to be nullable per se, but for this demo, I wanna make it nullable to show you how to deal with the interoperability of Java APIs that are by nature nullable. So Kotlin needs to be able to interact with that API and know that that's nullable coming in. Please pay attention to the first line. The open here declares that this class is not final. By default, all classes in Kotlin are final, and that'll be an issue when it comes to building this in Gradle, because the task needs to explicitly be extended from via Gradle, and it provides a proxy. And we need to mark it as open such that Gradle can inherit from it and add its own logic. Here's that version of create file function when translated line by line, similar to Groovy. Kotlin does not have checked exceptions, so any uncaught exception will just be elevated to the caller. Here we have another version that's a bit more idiomatic. We've replaced the for loop with a for each and a function literal. But what's more interesting here is this last line. Here we're using the double bang operator. Remember how key file was nullable? Well, what we're saying here with the double bang operator is that key, if key file is null, just throw the null pointer exception. And that's another way to deal with nullable objects in, in with nullable objects coming from Java. Here's our version of the Pojo as the Gradle extension. And this uses the data class from Kotlin. And now we're looking at the plugin class. Similar to before, we want to add the extension to the project. And again, we want to use the after evaluate here to allow the extension to be set in the build.gradle. And while this is cleaner than the Java example that I showed earlier, at this stage, it still looks quite verbose, and I'd love to further improve on that. Some examples, the, uh, the, find, the get by name with the holder 
you're looking that up, that's just not going to autocomplete. So what can we do to simplify this? Well, by utilizing a couple extension functions, we can assign a configure function to the project. In the first line, extensions, and, uh, and in extensions on the second line, one will be able to make the code a lot more concise and comfortable to those coming from Groovy. So here's the example of how it looks like before and after we use those extension functions to clean it up. You can see in the second example how we move towards a more declarative and Groovy-like syntax. So now we have the final version of our plugin in Kotlin. Just like with the Groovy version, we add the extension, and the after evaluation is done to create a task. We create a file based on the extension data that was supplied. It's declarative, concise, and familiar to Groovy developers. But it's consistent with the Kotlin that is potentially already in your Android app. If you use Anko or similar patterns in your Android app, all of your code can start to look like this as well. I believe this reduces the context switching, the overhead, and it allows for a faster move between different layers of the stack. I know I've run into uh, a large case of developers that have a little bit of anxiety in hopping into their build tooling coming from Android apps, and I hope that something like this can start to make that a little more approachable. We've talked about a lot of info here today. There's some great resources on the web to help you dig deeper into the language. First is the official docs. They're a great learning resource with a ton of info. I'd recommend starting there. The Kotlin Cohen's are a great way to learn and play with Kotlin in your browser. It's an interactive IDE. Enco is that cool plugin that I showed earlier. Um, it's open source. You can dig into that. It's kind of cool to replace the XML layouts. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily using that in production. I know that some apps are, um, but it's kind of cool to see how that evolves. There's also the official Gradle repo that has examples of using Kotlin and build scripts now. There was another talk given by Jake Wharton actually last year at Ordev that dives a lot deeper into using Kotlin in Android development. Uh, I'd recommend uh, watching that. There's also been a lot of other great Kotlin talks coming out of the Android scene recently if you wanted more information on using that in Android. Lastly, uh, this sample Gradle plugin is uh, open source. Uh, and this one that we built today, and its Kotlin version, lives in this repo on GitHub. Um, these are all clickable links from the slides that will be shared. The more people use and contribute to Kotlin, the faster we can all have a modern language for our day jobs. Since Google may take a while to officially sanction Kotlin for Android, if they ever do, it's up to us in the community to drive the best practices forward. While Google owns Android, it's an open source ecosystem. And we are all responsible for making it better. I can take some questions now. And uh, if you don't want to say them out loud, then I'm happy to talk afterwards as well. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. I, um, we got one question um, from the apps. Um, and that's oh, whether yeah. Kotlin has um, support for Lint in Android Studio right now. Um, the linting tooling isn't yeah. great. The, uh, tooling in general isn't awesome. Um, Jake, did they introduce lint support in 104? It's somewhat recent, 103. So it's, it's recent, but um, I don't think there's a lot of uh, out-of-the-box lint tooling for the things in Kotlin that you might want to be checking for, so it would just be the Android lints that you run. Yep. Uh, I don't know, are there any questions from the audience? I'm surprised nope. no one's asking me about the downsides of Kotlin. <laughs> yeah, maybe you could say something about that. Uh, I, well, I mean, it's it's not the first party tooling that's built by the Android team, so it's definitely running a little slower. Um, build times are slower. Uh, there's still finickiness in the IDE. Um, if you're using an alternative build system like Buck, uh, you're going to have some issues getting it running. Uh, it's definitely a fast moving environment, so the tooling will get there, but it's it's definitely a work in progress. So is it something that you would, you, you would try to... Oh, uh, absolutely. Do everyone, uh, absolutely. two guys over in the corner? Um, no, I mean, for us, we've had multiple teams at Uber that have been, been investigating it, using it in testing, different things for a little while. I know there's been plenty of other teams. Um, Pinterest has some of their code written in it. I, I know Square's worked in Kotlin a little bit on some of their stuff. Uh, it's definitely up and coming, and it's going to be a great way to put into your apps. But 
um, it's definitely, since it's still evolving as an ecosystem and the tooling's coming up around it, um, it's something to be thoughtful about the migration. Okay, thank you, Ty, and uh, please give him a hand and remember to rate the session.